Welcome to session one of Dewey Decimal Classification class. Uh, my name is Emily Nimsenkant. I am the Cataloging Librarian at the Nebraska Library Commission. Um, this class is going to be taking place in three sessions, as you probably know. There will be today, next Tuesday, and the Tuesday after that. Um, the sessions are scheduled for an hour and a half each. This one might be a little bit shorter. Um, what's going to happen in the other two sessions is that we'll spend the first half hour or so going over the assignment from the week before so that we can all benefit from each other's um, experience with the questions, and then we'll have about an hour's worth of content. So today there's obviously no um, assignment to go over, so we're just going to go ahead and jump into the content. Um, one thing I do want to make sure you're aware of is the class webpage is available. Um, I will make the PowerPoint slides available as a handout before each class session on this website. Um, this is also where you will find the assignment for each week. There will be three assignments for the class, and those are Word documents you can um, fill out and then email me to submit them. And this is also where uh, the recordings of each live session will be afterwards, so if you either aren't able to attend one of them or if you just want to go back and look at what was said during the session, you can always do that there. And in case you ever miss an email with the login information or forget what it was, it'll be the same for each week, but I will post the link to the live session. Actually, it already is posted there, so you can always go to the class website to find out how to get to the live sessions on Tuesdays. Here is kind of a brief outline of what we're going to be covering in the three sessions. Um, the first one today will be kind of just an overview of Dewey Decimal Classification, talking about things like notes in the schedules, how to read them, the concept of subjects versus disciplines, um, the manual, which is part of the Dewey Decimal Classification, and Web Dewey, which is the online um, version of the Dewey Decimal Classification. For this class, you do not need to have access to a print version. I will be giving you a trial login for the Web Dewey online product. Um, next week, we'll be talking in a little bit more depth about subjects and disciplines, and then we'll start into probably the most intricate part of assigning numbers with Dewey, and that is number building using the tables. And we'll start talking about Table 1 next week, and then Session 3 will be all about the tables, Table 1, 2, 3, and 4. And if you're not quite sure what I'm talking about when I say tables, don't worry, all will become clear. Well, we'll talk about those more in our overview today. So here is kind of an overview of the current form of Dewey Decimal Classification. There are two versions, um, abridged versus full. Abridged is just what it sounds like. It's a shorter version. It doesn't go into as much depth. It's just in the print version is just one volume. It only has four tables for building numbers, so um, the numbers are not as long as involved as they are with full Dewey. Generally, the rule of thumb is that it's appropriate for libraries with 20,000 titles or fewer. If you have fewer than 20,000 titles, you probably don't need really long, in-depth numbers that you would get with full Dewey. The full Dewey, on the other hand, in the print version is four volumes, has six tables for building numbers, and is appropriate for larger libraries or perhaps some special libraries if you have, you know, a, a really, really in-depth coverage of a particular topic and you need to make distinctions between um, different facets of the topic that, you know, a more general library wouldn't need to make, then you might need to um, have the full version of Dewey. Um, a new edition is issued in print about every seven years. Um, monthly updates are provided online. Obviously, the Web Dewey online product is um, updated more often than that. It's updated quarterly. And here is the URL to OCLC's site for Dewey updates. I should say that the Dewey Decimal Classification is a product of OCLC now. Um, it's not freely available, it's under copyright, and it is sold either in print or online through OCLC.
um, here's just some um, examples of some things you will get with the print version, or actually well, it's available online as well, but here's a shot of how it looks in the print version. Um, the numbers have you know notes that tell you what things should go in each one. Um, here is the various parts of, well, we're going to focus more on a bridge Dewey here, but basically full Dewey has these same parts. Um, generally, each edition will have a section on new features, things that were added since the last edition. The next part of DDC is the introduction, and with a lot of books, you, know, you might think that the introduction is kind of extra material, something that you know you can probably skip and get to the meat of it. Um, if you're just starting with Dewey, I would definitely caution against doing that. The introduction is an integral part of Dewey. It has all the directions for how to use Dewey, basically. So do not disregard the introduction. The introduction has so much material that it actually has its own index and glossary, so that should tell you something about um, how involved the introduction is. Dewey also has a manual, which is basically where you can go to kind of read about distinctions between Dewey numbers that are commonly confused. A lot of times if you're in the schedules looking at a particular number and it will say for 423.1 versus 425.1, see the manual. And you know, just it's explanations that are too long to fit into the actual text of the schedule will be found in the manual. For then they're usually things that you know are commonly mistaken for each other. So if there's a note about something that is in the manual, you can be rest assured that if you're unsure about something, a lot of other people have been too. <coughs> they generally have kind of a summary of things that either have been relocated to new numbers or discontinued since the last time. Um, as I said, there are tables that can be applied to basically any Dewey number to make it longer and more specific. And we'll get into more details on those in the second and third class sessions. Then there are summaries, which are the basic overviews of the various sections, you know, the 100s and 200s and so on and so forth. And then the actual meat of Dewey is in the schedules. This is where you can look up the particular numbers and find out what they are used for. After this is the relative index, which is just what it sounds like. It's an index where you can look up what number is used for a particular topic. This is probably the way you will find your way into Dewey most of the time. Um, if you know you have a book about dogs or camping or whatever, and you need to know the number, you will start looking in the index, which is the list of text terms, and then they will tell you which number to go to in the schedules. So like I said, the introduction basically equals instructions. Do not ignore the introduction. Um, it tells you how to use the different parts of Dewey, how to choose between numbers, how to build numbers, which means how to add on numbers from the tables. Um, I don't have it up on the class site yet, but I will be putting up a list of Dewey Decimal Classification resources, um, things that are either available online or here in print in the Library Commission's collection that you can check out. So look for that on the course webpage. As you work with Dewey, you'll notice that both in the print version and the online version, there are things called notes in the schedules. Um, the introduction in Section 7 tells you more about what to do with these. Um, notes can serve a variety of purposes. Basically, they tell you what to use a particular number for. Think of them like a scope note when you're you know, assigning subject headings. There's usually a scope note telling you what a particular term is used for, and this is the same thing with numbers. Um, notes can specify what's covered in a particular class. Um, it can provide cross-references saying, no, don't use this number if you're working with a particular topic. Use this other one instead. Um, it can provide some instructions on choosing between two classes that might seem equally good and building numbers. And it can describe various options if there are, you know, perhaps different aspects of a topic that are covered by two different numbers. 
We will discuss notes that tell you class here, meaning they describe what exactly is put at this particular call number, um, including notes. These, again, tell you sort of various topics that are included under a particular call number. Um, notes that tell you to class something somewhere else. See also, that tell you something that you might want to consider in addition, a different number. See manual, as I told you, the manual can provide information about um, numbers that are often confused for each other. Um, standard subdivision notes are there. Um, standard subdivisions come from table one, and we're going to talk about that more later, but you will sometimes see notes that tell you a little bit more about how to use the standard subdivisions. And sometimes you'll see notes that start out with the words add to base number, and these are sort of examples of number building on a smaller scale. You don't use one of the extra tables, but it will tell you how to build numbers if you need to make a more specific call number. So here is an example of a class here note. Um, this is the print version, but it looks basically the same in the online version. You know, if you're looking up at 005.74, that's the number for data files and databases, and it says class here, data file processing, data file and database management, database design, and architecture. So it just kind of tells you um, what you should use this number for. This one also has an including note. Um, it tells you sort of some more specific terms. You know, if you had looked up any of these terms in the relative index, you probably would have been directed here, and that's why. Even though the official term for this call number is data files and databases, it also includes all of these things. Um, this page has a C manual note, so that will tell you that these numbers are often confused. This one also has a C note that says, if you're working with specific types of data files and databases, go see this other number. And so that's basically how notes work in context. They're just our kind of a guidebook telling you how to use this number and how not to use this number and other numbers that might be kind of confused with this number. Are there any questions so far before we kind of get into the meat of classifying with Dewey? Okay, it doesn't look like it. Um, again, please feel free to interrupt me with questions as we go along. Section 5 of the introduction covers the instructions on basically how to use Dewey Decimal Classification. And the five steps are determining the subject of a work, determining the discipline of the work, what to do if you have more than one subject in the same discipline, one or more subjects in more than one discipline, and then what's called the table of last resort. Um, at this point, I think I should probably stop and talk about the distinction in Dewey between a subject and a discipline. Um, the official definition from Dewey of a subject is an object of study or a topic. Um, it could be a person or a thing. Um, subjects are generally more specific than disciplines. So that's one way to think of it. Um, According to Dewey, a discipline is really more of a field of study. Um, one thing to remember is that one particular topic can be approached from multiple disciplines. Um, for example, if you were dealing with, say, the topic of dogs, you could either be dealing with sort of the domestic aspect of it, care for a pet dog, um, that would fall under the Dewey Discipline of Animal Husbandry, or you could be interested in more of the biology of dogs, and that would obviously fall under the discipline of biology. So sometimes you will look up a number or a topic in the relative index and see that it has multiple numbers listed that seem pretty far apart. You know, one will be in the 600s and one will be in the 700s or something like that, and that generally means that this topic could be approached from various disciplines. So disciplines are more broad, and they're really more fields of study, whereas subjects are more specific topics. 
So for example, here is a book that, you know, just looking at the title, it's kind of hard to tell what discipline this topic is in. And so we'll go through kind of a number of options as for how this could be treated. Obviously, if you're actually cataloging it and you have the book in front of you, you will have more information about where it should go. But this will, as we're going through this, you'll start to see how you would navigate Dewey in order to find the number you're looking for. So we had a book called The Ciphers, Breaking the Code. And so we'll start out showing you how to do it in the print Dewey, but then we'll switch to the online web Dewey, since that's what you'll probably be using for the class. So if you browse the relative index and looked for ciphers, you would see it's under ciphers with cryptography in parentheses, and it directs you to number 652. So when you go to 652, you'll see it's under the larger heading of processes of written communication, and it says includes interdisciplinary works on cryptography. And if you did this in the um, online product, WebDewey, I would definitely recommend browsing rather than searching. Browsing will basically take you to an alphabetical list similar to the print version of the relative index, and I would make sure that you select relevant in index radio button there. So if you browse for ciphers in the relative index, you will get a few different options. You'll get the 652.8, um, ciphers in the Bible apparently, um, ciphers from computer science. So again, this is what I'm talking about with subject versus discipline. The subject of ciphers or cryptography can be approached from a number of dif disciplines, including, you know, this one was written communication and this one is computer science. So it would depend on what your book was about. Um, same thing if you browse for cryptography, you know, that seems to be a word that is used to describe this topic. So it has a number at 652.8 and then there's a number of different um, Num disciplines that it could be approached from. Apparently the use of cryptography in the armed forces has its own number. Again, the discipline of computer science and the discipline of recreation. So more things like, you know, word hunts and crossword puzzles. I assume that would be the type of cryptography that is recreational. So here's again just a little bit closer up. If you and to refresh on how we got here, we browsed for cryptography. Make sure browse is selected, and make sure relative index is selected. You know, just so as you're going through when you're doing your assignments with WebDewey, if you get results that really don't make sense, I would you know encourage you to check those two things. Make sure you're browsing and make sure you're in the relative index. And again, we get these results for cryptography with the various disciplines. And so if you weren't sure which discipline your book dealt with, you know, I would go and click into all these numbers and read the notes and figure out which number uses fits your purposes best. Again, actually having your um, book in front of you rather than just this title we're working with would make it easier to choose between the numbers. But again, you'll notice that once you click through to one of those numbers, you will be taken to that place in the schedule. You know, if you were working with the print version, you would have to flip to that particular place in the book. But with the online version, you can just use the hyperlinks. So if we were, we actually had this book in hand, and it was just something that was kind of general information about cryptography, we would go ahead and use the number 652. Um, you'll notice that there's a note here that says class here interdisciplinary works on cryptography. Um, that would mean if you have a work, interdisciplinary work is one where the topic is approached from more than one discipline. So if it had information on both recreational uses of cryptography and computer science uses of cryptography, for example, that would go in 652 and most likely 652.8, 
for the interdisciplinary number. On the other hand, if you had decided that your book was about um, data security and cryptography from a computer standpoint, it would most likely go in 005.8. So I've been covering browsing so far when I've been talking about navigating Dewey and the relative index especially, and I, for the most part I would recommend that, but I will talk a little bit more about the search interface of Web Dewey. If you choose to search, um, and you go, I would recommend going to advanced search so you have more options. Uh, if you want to search in relative index, you can. So if you searched for say cryptography instead of browsing, you would get results like this. And one thing you'll notice about this is that the word you search for can be used in basically any area of the Dewey schedules. Um, usually if you're browsing the relative index, you're going to just find things that are actual headings used as part of the Dewey numbers. Um, you know, it would be something that would be in bold like this. But we search for cryptography and you'll see that it just appears in a note. So depending on your situation, that could either, you know, help you find things that you aren't finding anywhere else. Um, if you are kind of stuck as to, you know, you know you have a book of cryptography but you're not really sure what Dewey calls it, it could help. On the other hand, it could kind of bring in some noise to your search result and bring in things that just have the word mentioned in passing. So, you know, it's kind of use it when the situation is right. I would recommend starting with browse, but search can also be useful. So like we said, there was another um, aspect to this that if you were doing cipher puzzles for recreation, um, that would be in the 700s. And sometimes it's a little bit more ambiguous to figure out what um, the discipline it is. For example, this book could be written from a historical approach. As we've seen from searching for ciphers in cryptology, the results don't say anything about cryptography in a specific time period. So you might have to kind of search from a different angle. You might try searching or browsing for World War II. And so when you browse for World War II, you'll see that the number that comes up is 940.53. And so again, if you click through the schedules, that is the number for World War II. There is a note that tells you that 940.54 is the military history of World War II, so if this was a book about how codes were used by the military, you might want to consider using that number. So there's some art involved to Dewey numbers. Um, it isn't always an exact science, um, and the main thing to remember, you know, to coming away from all of this, is a big factor in deciding between numbers is what works best in your collection. You know, if you have other books on similar topics and you want it to be close to that one so that when people are browsing they can find them together, you know, definitely make that a consideration. You don't have to blindly accept whatever comes in a record you're copy cataloging. You definitely still use your judgment and you don't get paralyzed trying to decide between two numbers. Just you know, make the call based on your local collection. So now that we've talked about determining the subject of a work and determining the discipline of a work, how do you handle books that have more than one subject in the same discipline? And here are a set of rules that you can use to decide. These are laid out in the instructions in the introduction of Dewey. You kind of take these in order. First you check and see if the fuller treatment rule applies, and we're going to go through all these separately, but this is just sort of the order of preference. You check for fuller treatment, then the first of two, rule of three, rule of zero, and rule of application. And we'll go through each one, one at a time here. 
the fuller treatment is basically just what it sounds like. Um, if two or more subjects are included in the book, and one subject has more coverage than the others, choose the number that goes with that subject. So, for example, we had a book called Schooling Alternatives, and it has information about parochial, private, and home schools. And let's just say, for example, the material about parochial schools covers 40 pages, private school covers 35 pages, and home school materials covers 82 pages. So you could class with basically any of these, but according to the rules of Dewey, you want to go with the one that covers the most material, so that would be home school. So I would search by start by browsing the uh, relative index for homeschools. And the number you get is 371.042. And I would read up and down the hierarchy to make sure you're in the correct discipline. Um, and what I mean by that is kind of look at the hierarchy of numbers here. And we are in the education, so that does seem to make sense. I would recommend going up a level in the hierarchy to check for any instructions that contradict that uh, most specific number. I would look down in the notes and see if there's anything that tells you not to use that number. Um, it doesn't usually happen, but it's always good to check. In this case, we're okay. Again, you could even go up one more level. Um, we're under the higher level of 371 here, schools and their activities. And I don't see anything that would tell us not to use this homeschool number. And one more level, up at 370. There are some notes, but it does not tell us anything about the alternative schools, so we are okay to use the homeschool number, I would say. And again, up at the highest level, at 370 education, there are no notes at all. So that definitely doesn't have any contradictory information. The instructions here include what's called a table of preference. Um, I just want to stop and point this out as something you'll see sometimes um, in various areas of the instructions. Um, it gives a table of preference if you have um, something that deals with multiple topics here. This is the order you should choose to class things in. Um, just really quick, so we, I think we're pretty sure we're going to use the homeschool number because that has the most coverage, fuller treatment. But just to kind of show you the numbers for private schools and parochial schools, you'll see that religious schools is 371.07. Christian schools or parochial schools are 371.071, so that would be the other number if we were looking for other options. And there are no further subdivisions that apply. We don't know for sure that we're talking about just Catholic schools. And private schools is under 371.02. and there are no further subdivisions under there. We have a question coming in that uh, says, why not 371.04, which cover all the areas? That is a very good question. Um, and the answer to it, I guess um, there are situations in which, if you had a book covering all three of these, you would. Um, but that would be used mostly when the treatment is more equal if, you know, there were about 40 pages on each of the topics. In this case, um, the discrepancy between them is so large, let me go back to that screen, um, you know, parochial school material and private school material covers 35 to 40 pages, and homeschool material is almost twice that. So in this case, according to the rules laid out in Dewey, we should go with the topic that really is covered the most. Again, that's strict interpretation of the Dewey rules. If you feel that you know your patrons would be better served by using that, you could certainly go ahead and do that. And as we'll see, that is definitely the 
option to do when the treatment of all three topics is equal, but in this case where there is a clear-cut topic that is covered more fully than the others, the Dewey rules say to go with the number for that topic. So here are the three numbers for the various options. And according to polar treatment rule, we would go with the number for homeschools, so 371.04. Now, again, and you know, remember all these rules, you kind of take them in order. You evaluate the first one first. Um, if If there's a subject that receives more full treatment than the others, you go with that one. But if two or more, two subjects receive equal treatment, then you go with the number, the subject whose number comes first, first of two rule. That's what it means. So this is not a situation like the last one where we had one topic that received more full treatment. In this case, if you have a topic that has two subjects and they're both treated equally, then you go with the one whose number comes first. Um, as we'll see, there are two exceptions to this, unless there are instructions that say otherwise, and unless the two topics are the only two major subdivisions of a subject, and we'll see examples of all of these. So let's pretend we are working with a book called Waves of Sensation. It has a book containing information about both light waves and sound waves, and they're roughly equal, 82 pages versus 79 pages. So if we look up either light or sound in the relative index, we would be taken to um, the area for 534 to 538 specific forms of energy. And you'll see that light is under 535, and sound is under 534. Now remember, one of the, the exceptions to this rule is if there were only two subdivisions. If sound and light were the only two subdivisions, then we would have to, to think differently about this. But since there are also other subdivisions for heat, electricity, and magnetism, then we simply apply the first of two rule and we go with the number that comes first in the schedules. And so that would be 534 for sound because it comes before light. So I would classify this book given the information we have, with sound at number 534. Now we'll look at the first exception to this rule, unless instructed otherwise, pretty much applies across the board to anything relating to Dewey. If there are specific instructions right there in a note at a particular number, that trumps just about anything as far as the general rules that apply to everybody else goes. So that's why important, it's important to always read the schedules and find out what exactly you're dealing with. So let's say we have a book called Thank You Notes for Children and contains examples of thank you notes. This would probably fall under the category of etiquette, so that's what I would probably look up in the relative index. Now you'll see that there are a couple of options here that might apply. Um, for age groups, you know, one that particularly applies to children might fall under 395.1, but it's thank you notes, so social correspondence also might apply. And so normally we would go with 395.1 because first of tool, two, that comes first. Um, however, there's a note here that says, unless other instructions are given, class is subject with aspects of two or more subdivisions in the number coming last. So in this case, it's the exact opposite. And I have to be honest, I don't know the reason behind all of these rules, why in this case it's more important to do that, but always check for notes when you're assigning original Dewey numbers. So in this case, we would go with social correspondence 395.4. The other exception to the first of two rule is if you have a topic where um, the two topics you're deciding between are the only two major subdivisions of a subject. So let's see an example. Um, we have a book called 
Celebrate Freedom. Um, let's say this is a kid's book, obviously, because it's not very long. It has information about both the 4th of July and Bastille Day. The 4th of July material covers 8 pages, and the Bastille Day material covers 7, so it's roughly equal. If we browse for the 4th of July in the relative index, we would be directed to 394.2634. And Bastille Day, if we browse for that in the relative index, we would be directed to 394.2635. And on either of those, you may notice that if you go up a level, you'll be at holidays of June, July, and August. And the only two subdivisions under this number are Fourth of July and Bastille Day. There may be other holidays in June, July, and August, but they do not have their own Dewey numbers, apparently. So in this case, the rule, the exception says that if you're dealing with a topic where, actually if you're dealing with two topics and they're the only subdivisions of a particular bigger number, you class with that um, more general number. So in this case, we would go up one level and this book would be at 394.263 because that covers both Fourth of July and Bastille Day. So that is the other exception to the first to two rule. Now, if you have a book with not two subjects, but three subjects, in that case, rather than using first of two, you would go with the rule of three, which says to class a work on three or more subjects that are all subdivisions of the same broader subject in the first higher number that includes them all. So basically what we just did there with Fourth of July and Bastille Day, where we picked the more general number that includes both of them, that's what you always do if you have three or more subjects that are all treated basically equally. So going back to our schooling alternatives example, it still contains parochial, private, and homeschool information, but let's say that instead of having homeschools receive the fullest treatment, everything's roughly equal. We have parochial schools for 40 pages, private schools 35 pages, and homeschools now 38 pages instead of 82. So they're all basically equal. So the rule of fuller treatment doesn't apply. In this case, the rule of three applies. So this would be the case in which you would go with the um, 371.04, that is the first more general number that includes the numbers for all of the topics that this book includes. Again, I would recommend you go up one level just to make sure there's no instructions that tell you to do differently. You know, you would be on the lookout for things like a table of preference or, you know, anything else that contradicts the notes that the specific numbers, in this case, were okay. So I actually have a typo on this slide, I see. Um, it should be 371.04, not 371. This next rule you'll see probably less frequently. I would say most of the time your decisions will fall under either the rule of fuller treatment, the first of two rule, or the rule of three. Um, but occasionally you'll see the rule of zero. And basically what that tells you to do is you prefer subdivisions numbered one through nine over zero, um, or prefer subdivisions with one zero to those with two zeros. Basically what this means is you choose the number as specific as possible. Again, I won't go into too much detail about this because you won't see it very often, but for example, if you had a book about Eastern philosophy, you should class it at 181, which is the specific number for Eastern philosophy rather than 180, which is the number for ancient, medieval, and Eastern philosophy. If there's more a more specific number that just deals with just the topic you're looking at, um, use that number. You know, even though the phrase Eastern philosophy occurs here, if you click into the schedules, you'll see that at 181 there's a number for just Eastern philosophy. So. That's the rule of zero. Again, I wouldn't worry about it too much because you won't necessarily have to make a decision on that too often. 
One that you might see more often is the rule of application. Um, when one subject is shown as affecting or influencing another one, the subject being acted on is the one to be classified. Um, and again, here's the t three words you'll see pretty often in Dewey, unless otherwise instructed. So let's say you have a book called Nuclear Fallout, How the Atom Bomb Changed World Politics. So in this case, world politics is being acted on by the atom bomb. So world politics would be what you would want to browse for in the relative index. Um, when you do so, it will redirect you to world history. I just skipped the processes and got you to the number we need. Um, you can click on specific historical periods to find the number that you need. Um, you'll see 909.1 to 909.8 deals with specific historical periods. Um, looking more closely at the book, you know, would probably tell you if, if there's a more specific time period. Um, I'm going to assume that the atom bomb is sometime in the 20th century. Um, I guess it would depend on your particular book if it was talking about, you know, when the atom bomb was immediately developed or later on, but you can probably at least guess that it's going to be 909.82. So knowing what we do about the book, um, because the atom bomb is acting upon world politics, world politics or world history, as the accepted term in Dewey goes, would be the number we would go with rather than the atom bomb. Um, I'll just briefly say that basically if you're dealing with more than one subject in the same discipline, these are the five rules that apply. Um, we'll start talking next week about more than one subject in a different discipline. So just to review, Fuller Treatment Rule, First of Two Rule, Rule of Three, Rule of Zero, and Rule of Application are the numbers you should use. And so those might come into play in the assignment for this week. Um, I want to tell you really quickly about the um, access to Web Dewey that we have for the class. Um, the URL to go to is connection with an X dot OCLC dot org. Let me pull that up for you. Okay. When you get there, this is what you'll see. And under authorization, you type in that number that's on the screen. Um, you don't have to put the hyphens in. You can just put the number. And then the password is Tulip. And this is the same account for everybody. It should be fine with multiple people using it at once. Once you're logged in, what you want to do is go to this Dewey Services tab at the top. That's the one, two, three, fourth tab over. And you'll get this transferring to Web Dewey message. If you have any troubles logging into this during the week, please let me know, email or call. Um, if you do have a print version in your library and you would prefer to use that, that's fine. Um, on the assignment, there's a space to tell me which version of Dewey you're using. So, you know, if you're using something other than this Web Dewey, just make sure that I know it so I don't, you know, judge your assignment differently based on something just because you're using an older version. Um, to get started browsing, I would recommend going to Browse up here. And then, like I said, most of the time I would recommend starting in the relative index. So then if you do cryptography, which is one of our example searches, and you'll just have hyperlinks that take you to the particular area in the schedules. So that's the very basics of Web Dewey. I think it should be pretty self-explanatory, but definitely do not hesitate to contact me if you need help with it during the week. Um, the assignment is available now on the course webpage. It's a Word document. Um, if you have any issues with um, downloading it, please let me know. It is due by 8 a.m. a week from today, Tuesday, July 15th. Um, please submit it by emailing it to me. Um, I won't be giving you individual feedback. Basically, I'll just you know glance over them. I'll make sure you 
did them, I will you know check out your participation for that, um, and I will look over them to you know kind of see if there's any common problems that everybody's having. But your feedback on the assignment will come during next week's class session. We will spend the first half hour or so going over the correct answers, and at that time you can ask questions and get clarification about anything that you didn't understand. Next session, um, I will have the slides available on the web prior to class. We'll be talking about one or more subjects in more than one discipline and the table of last resort, and we'll start talking about table one a little bit. So it looks like I was right that we ran um, short this week. That's generally how the first session goes because we don't have an assignment to go over. Next week I do anticipate we will go the full hour and a half from 10 to 11.30. Does anybody have any other questions for this week? Again, as you're working on the assignment throughout the week, please do not hesitate to contact me through either email or um, give me a call. Um, I see a number coming in here. What's the login for Dewey? Um, let me skip back really quickly. Um, when you get to um, connection.oclc.org, here is your authorization and password. And these slides are also available on the course website, so you, know, you can always consult that here. But if there are no other questions, then um, thank you for joining me, and I will see you again online next week.